Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. Stronger, the study through Ephesians. And I will begin with verse 17. With the Lord's authority, I say this, Live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. But that isn't what you learned about Christ. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, Throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. So stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. If you are a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good hard work and then give generously to others in need. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Hey, in some of our homes, this might be the perfect sermon for today, right? With, the, with our siblings bothering each other. So, hey, what a powerful scripture um, I know in our home, we, ha- we have amazing parents, but uh, uh, my, my sister and I, my brother, we're not perfect. And so we had our many times where we weren't being kind to each other. So I pray this can apply even to our homes today. Paul is talking about a transformation that took place. He's saying in a nutshell, don't live who you used to be. You've been given a new nature, a new identity, a new way of living. Put that on. And here's the thing, he gets into some details of what that looks like. Don't lie, don't do this, don't do that. Instead, do this. Don't be angry and slander, instead be kind. So Paul goes through this new transformation, this new way of living in our scripture today. And it's all possible, it's possible to live this new life because of what Jesus has done for us at salvation and through his spirit living in us. We're in the first verse, and it says, with the Lord's authority, I say this, live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they, listen to this, this condition of those who are not uh, saved. They are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have clothed, closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. I want to be upfront on the beginning here and say that Paul is not saying compare yourself and be mean about it. He's not saying look how, how bad they are, look how good you are. He's saying this is what you used to be like, no longer live like this. And if anything, church, we should have pity and compassion for people who are like this. The condition is very bleak, hopelessly confused, hardened heart. A lust, in the Greek, it talks about a lust that cannot be satisfied. A greed for more is the context in the Greek here, the understanding of the original language. It's this inability to even feel sin as wrong. That's how off they are. The word harden here, let me get my note for you, is porosis, and it's a petrification It's like when two bones break and then they fuse back together, it's harder than the bone originally was. It's so hard that it can't be broken. They can't receive 
except unless the power of Jesus Christ comes over them. There's no sense of shame. I won't try to pronounce the Greek here, but it has to do with lost all sensitivity. They don't feel any moral stimuli. Uh, the stab of pain from sinning in their life. If they sin, they don't feel bad at all. That's how off they are, hopelessly confused. And when I read this today, you know what I thought about? I thought that I never want anyone in this condition to lead my son. I don't want anyone to be over my son and influence my son or my daughter, my kids, if they live like this. I don't want my, my kids to be around and to uh, indulge and enjoy in other kids that may think and feel this way. So there's a sense of guarding here. There is a sense of, of caution and protection. But at the same time, I feel for kids and adults who are hopelessly confused and lost and do not feel the shame of sin in any way. He's saying here, though, he's not making it about them as much as he's making it about them. He's saying no longer live like that. No longer live like that. That's what I've saved you from. Warren Wearsby said, their minds are darkened so that they cannot think straight about spiritual matters. I remember I asked for someone's forgiveness one time and they didn't understand why I was asking for forgiveness because they didn't think I did anything wrong and I clearly did. And I realized I was talking to someone who does not have the spirit of Christ in them. They didn't even realize I had done anything wrong because for them that wasn't wrong, but to me it was. Do you see how that can happen? Why would that happen? 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 16 is about where Paul says that we don't speak with words, uh, human words, but words from the spirit, wisdom from the spirit. And only those who have the spirit of God can truly understand what the spirit of God is trying to say because his thoughts are not our thoughts, his ways are not our ways, but we can, we can comprehend as much as God allows us to or we can of what God is trying to say and teach if we have the spirit of Christ. And in the end, it says in the last verse to have the mind of Christ. So we're gonna have people around us who do not have the mind of Christ. They don't have the spirit of God deposited in them to think the way we think. And he's saying, you used to be like that, no longer live like that. Now the light of Christ, the spirit of Christ has come into you. So now you think differently about sin. Now you feel it. Now you think about loving your enemy. A transformation has taken place in their lives. The Christian cannot pattern himself after an unsaved person because they have the spirit of Christ in them to stop them from doing that. And one of the notes that I put here uh, from, from my own personal study is this. We are not preoccupied with the aspirations of this world or the lust and desires of the flesh. We are preoccupied with doing the Lord's will. That's the sign of redeemed life that lives in the light. So the sign of being in Christ is that we're not preoccupied with our old way of living as Paul is instructing them to stay away from. We're so caught up in doing God's will, we don't want to go back. He goes on to say this, but that isn't what you learned. The word learn here actually has the meaning of discipleship, to be discipled, to be a student and learn about Christ. So he's not talking so much about salvation here. He's done that many times. He's talking about what he's learned from, what they have learned from the gospel, the teaching, and from Jesus Christ. That is, that is what you learned about Christ. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature. How do you know you have an old sinful nature if you don't have Christ? When you have Christ, you realize you have a sinful nature. Well, he goes on to say even more, and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. That's an ongoing active activity of progressively putting on your new nature. And by the way, you can't 
put on your new nature without the Holy Spirit in you. We can't be a Christian without Christ. And we can't live holy without the Holy Spirit. So he puts that first for a reason because the next verse says, well, first of all, I love what he says here. Let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. That's not even our actions yet. An inner change results in an outer change, right? So for Paul, he doesn't want you to act like you're a Christian. He wants you to be washed and renewed and be like Christ on the inside. Your attitudes and thoughts will change. And therefore, that's, this is what happens. Put on your new nature. So how you live, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. That scared me when I read created to be like God. That scared me because I'm like far from God. But what he's saying here is, is to be like Christ. You have been made new to be like Christ. And the two words he uses is righteousness and holy or holiness. Why would he use that? Well, righteousness has to do with your vertical holiness, your vertical uh, goodness, how you love others and how you live a good character, uh, living good character of Christ. But then holiness has to do with your, uh, did I say vertical? I meant horizontal. Horizontal relationship with others. Vertical is your holiness with God. So we are to be holy and pure in God's sight. And then we are to live in our vertical relationships with righteousness and love. In other words, the command from Jesus, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbors as yourself. We are to be like Jesus who perfectly loved all of those around him, and then he loved his father. That's the new nature. They were unable to do that before Jesus came into their life and the Holy Spirit washed them and made them new. Now they are able to do it. In fact, because the Holy Spirit has shown up, they know what that looks like. Because Jesus was around as well and our eyewitnesses are teaching him and we have the word of God, we know what that looks like. One commentator used an interesting way of saying this. He said, lay aside the costume of their ungenerate, unregenerate selves or unsaved selves. Lay aside the costume. What is he saying there? He's saying that a newborn in Christ, a, a believer, any believer in Jesus Christ, if you live like your old self, you're acting like a costume for a play. You're putting on your old self and you shouldn't. That should be gone. Do you know what the word hypocrite is in the Bible? It has to do with this idea of acting on a stage play. To act like something or act in a way that you are not. The word hypocrite comes from the word act in the Greek. And so to act a way you shouldn't be acting. I find that a very powerful statement. To get rid of your old self because now it's a costume. It's not who you really are. Are you with me? BC days before Christ, you changed, right? Now, I'll get into how this applies more at the end, but uh, I remember uh, a couple years ago, I started this health journey. I lost weight. You know what I did? I went into my closet and I threw away all my old clothes or I gave them away because that was my old self with my old habits, my old ways of thinking. And through help of God, the grace of God and a health plan, I learned a new way to live, right? Now, I gave those clothes away. Why? So I wouldn't put them back on one day. Because they're my old clothes. I don't wear those anymore. I'm a new creation in the new thing I've been doing. Well, same thing spiritually. I'm a new creation in Christ. I leave those old ways behind. It's possible because the Holy Spirit lives in me, I can do it. Under the influence of the Holy Spirit, I can do it. And this is really important. You need to understand something. You may not feel like you're brand new, but you really are a new creation in Christ. We, it's hard for us to grasp this because we still know how off we can be and how messed up we can be. But a commentator said this, and I wanted to make sure we get it in our hearts and ears. 
It says, it is not the former nature refurbished, refurbished, better or improved, but a totally new creation to be like God as man was in the beginning. He's talking about the garden. Wow. So we're not dusting off our old nature and just trying to make it look pretty with a costume and makeup, right? No, in God's eyes, you're a brand new creation. That's deep. And we need to consider ourselves a new creation and then therefore live like that new person who is Jesus Christ. That is powerful. You know, the garden is the way it was all supposed to be. We were like him. We were behaving okay. We were doing right. And then we sinned. And Jesus has been fixing it ever since, bringing us back to the way we were in the garden. You know, that's the new heavens and the new earth and the new Jerusalem that's coming. That's it. We're going to be like that garden again, the way it was always meant to be. Just want to make sure I show you that. So he, he goes on. So here's some examples of some old nature, some old grave clothes, and now some grace clothes. Warren Wearsby likes to put it that way. You've given up your grave clothes for your grace clothes, the clothes that Christ has given you. And you know what he says? Stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. Church, God is truth, and so we're supposed to reflect truth. And it can be hard to walk this out at times. You know, how do we apply this personally? Um, there are some times where when someone says, how are you doing? What do we say? Good. That's one of the biggest lies <laughs> in the church family. It's okay to be honest and say, I'm not doing good. I need help. I need prayer. Would you pray with me? Can I share this with you? I like what John Stott said on this scripture. Fellowship is built on trust. And trust is built on truth. So falsehood undermines fellowship while truth strengthens it. The more we're honest with, our, with each other, the more we're truthful with one another, the more we would trust each other. Now, before you go and be honest with someone, make sure you read the, and listen to the previous sermon, speaking the truth in love, okay? And I taught last week, receive the truth in love as well. Receive it as well, knowing that that brother or sister in Christ loves you. And that's why they would say that in the first place. He goes on to say, do not sin in your anger by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. I love what the commentator and author J.A. Bengal said. He said, anger is neither commanded nor prohibited because anger itself is not wrong. But this is commanded not to permit sin to enter into your anger. So don't get to the point where you're so angry that you do and go say something you shouldn't say, go retaliate, go hurt someone. He's saying that's when anger is wrong. There is a righteous indignation when we hate sin and we hate injustice in our world. When we hate that people are going to hell, that is okay. But it'd be wrong to act if we hate someone and then hurt them. Following that. If we don't deal with the anger in our lives, that leads to more, and it usually leads to action. And anytime we don't deal with the anger, it leaves a door open for the devil to work. The devil looks for conflict in the church so he can throw more fuel on the fire. He's going to throw gasoline on that fire. It's better, and here's, why does it say foothold? It, here's a, here's a, a, a more modern day of putting it. If me and someone else are going through something, and I'm angry and I don't deal with it and talk it out or just let it go and forgive and I'm holding a grudge, it's like that door should be closing but I put my foot right in the door before it closes because I still got a problem with that person I haven't dealt with. 
I stop that, that interaction isn't solved. The door can be closed. We're moving on. Thank God for your forgiveness, your grace, your love. No, instead, because there's a grudge and there's still some anger there, I go ahead and I put my foot in that door so it doesn't close. And guess who can sneak in? Um, my wife and I, in our old home, we had a shed and we barely used it. And it was one of those sheds where, anyone seen the movie Arachnophobia? I mean, I'm pretty sure the spiders owned that shed more than I did. And uh, one day I'm working in the yard and a giant, and I say giant because it was too big for me, too big for my comfort, a rat snake, or they call them black snakes, uh, uh, was, it was right next to me. I didn't even see it. I'm working in the yard, and this thing was huge. I held it up afterwards. It was six feet. It was as tall as me, give or take. You know how people are with fish stories, right? It was this big. It was, I held it up. It was pretty big. Um, I'm so mad at myself because I never fixed the door to the shed. And I'm, I'm waiting for this thing to move away. He's, he's actually curled up and looking at me funny. And I'm like, hey, you need to get off my land. This is, this is actually my house. I own, you don't pay the bills, snake. You need to go. And the reason why is because our kids were outside playing. I was doing yard work. I didn't want this thing around us. And it was actually really defensive. Well, I stepped back, I let it calm down, and then I, as I moved forward, he started taking off and going away from us. Thank God. <laughs> the problem is, he turned towards my shed. And sure enough, that door was open. And I needed to go in there to get some shovels. My wife may remember this, but I prayed to Jesus and I entered that shed, knowing we were about to have a fight. <laughs> now, I do not play with snakes, okay? And I don't play, with, I mean, spiders, I'll take care of them. Snakes, just not my thing, like any normal human being. <laughs> and I needed to be in there because I was doing landscaping, I was getting rid of, I was building a, a flower bed, and I needed to get in there and I said, I don't want this thing living in there and making, you know, a family in there. Um, so I went in there and I could hear it going against the shed. <laughs> Just the scales rubbing against the wall. This thing was huge. And I go on the workbench. I jump up on the workbench, like more like crawl up on the workbench, panting to death, trying to get up there. And I'm standing on it shaking like this. Just because I can hear this thing moving, and then it stops. And I'm just like, I got to get rid of this thing. I, I should have just left it alone, and just, but I need to get shovels and everything. I want to go in and out. I didn't know how long it's going to hang out. And so I wait there for minutes, and all of a sudden I see a head stick out from the bottom of the workbench down below, because it was like a doors, it was doors in the way, so it was solid. I couldn't see underneath of it. And all of a sudden this snake head comes out, and I don't know if there's anyone sensitive about animals dying, close your ears. But I had a spade shovel and I hit that thing right in the head. <laughs> Victorious. <laughs> Victorious. <laughs> Woo. Now I thought about that in two ways spiritually. One, sometimes we got to deal with the snakes in our sheds because we allow them to get in there. We allowed the devil to slip in because we didn't deal with it in the first place. And I also learned physically to make sure my door is sealed tight, okay? Let's make sure. We, yeah, we need to deal with that anger or the devil will slip in. We need to deal with the unfinished, the, the reconciliation that's not taking place. We need to deal with it or the devil slips in and it becomes worse. I don't want the devil to have a foothold in any situation in my life. He doesn't belong in my life. Under the Mosaic law, by the way, all debts were to be returned and all wages paid for before sunset. So deal with the debt 
Deal with the conflict before going to bed. Now, if you're exhausted, sometimes we coach in marriage, go ahead and just go to sleep. That might help too. Maybe you're too tired and you're letting things get out of hand in marriage. You know, this happens. You know, we're so exhausted. We find out 15 minutes to an hour later, we're, we're arguing over something not even important because we're just tired and we just need to go to bed. But sometimes there's a serious offense that we need to deal with before we go to bed so the devil doesn't get a foothold. He goes on to say this, if you are a thief, I told you we're going to cover a lot of ground today. If you are a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good hard work and then give generously to others in need. I love that because he's not saying to stop stealing and then get a job or get, get to work and do your part. But then he's saying so that you can give generously. That's a Christian level right there. That's a whole new level. And I'll explain in a moment. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear him. The word here, use foul or abusive language or unwholesome talk in other translations, has to do with the Greek word used for rotten. So like rotten fruit or worthless, something worthless. In other words, let's be careful not to use worthless, rotten, language and talk with each other that does not feed or nourish each other. The contrast would be the fruit of Christ, the love of Christ, the kindness of Christ. Um, for me personally, I'm not big on superficial talk either. You know, like, hey, how you doing? Great, great, awesome. How's the weather? Oh, it's good. I'm not big on that. I know we do it to get through it, but the reality is I really want to know how someone's doing. I really care about people. And so sometimes superficial talk, that's not in view here. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about something that would hurt the body of Christ and something that doesn't even bring life to the body of Christ. So it could be coarse joking, perverted joking and laughing that we shouldn't do. This is what Paul is talking about. And instead, if we're going to say something, say something that's going to encourage and build up one another. Now, when it comes to the work, I wanted to show you a quote from Tyndale Commentary, so you know it's not just my words, but they say Christians are to work for their own living. And let me tell you that this is in the context of those who can work at this time, in this Bible time, the context, Paul's talking about those who can work and they're refusing to, and instead they're stealing, they're doing things they shouldn't do. He's saying, if you can work, you need to work. You need to pull your weight. And so it's in that context uh, so here's what he says. Christians are to work for their own living. More than that, they are to work to be able to give to those in need. The Christian motive for earning is not merely to have enough for oneself and one's own, and then perhaps for comforts and luxuries. That's the American way, isn't it? To have all we need for us. Now, the Christian, it's different for us. He goes on to say, but to have in order to give to the needy. Jesus loved taking care of the needy. It was taught many times in the Bible. The Christian philosophy of labor is thus lifted far above the thought of what is right or fair in the economic field. It is lifted to the place where there is no room for selfishness or the motive of personal profit at all. Giving becomes a motive for getting. In other words, I want to get more so that I can give. Wow. That's convicting. That's the heart of Jesus Christ. That's the heart of God. We learned about that in our generosity series. God is a generous God. And so I, I praise God for the examples in my life where it wasn't just to get everything and make me feel comfortable, but I was taught to make sure I can help others in need. And so even our church is a, such a giving church and generous church. It's a blessing to help those in our community as you continue to give. So we're moving forward. And he says this, and do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. The word guaranteeing is also seal. You've been sealed or branded uh, to be one of God's. You are one of God's by the Holy Spirit. You're identified as one of God's children by the Holy Spirit. 
The word grieve is used in other translations. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. What is he talking about here? Everything before it and a few ver- and a verses right after. Living our old way grieves and brings sorrow to the Holy Spirit. You know why? Because he lives in us. And it was a great cost for Jesus to die for us on the cross. And to trample on it and to live a way that we should not be living, to act in a way we shouldn't be acting, he's saying it grieves and it hurts the Holy Spirit in us. Isn't that kind of, isn't that humbling? That we can hurt the Holy Spirit by the way we live? I don't want to do that. And so we can tell because we'll feel that hurt when we're doing something wrong. We'll feel that check in our spirit. We'll go, man, I know this isn't right. I don't want to do that. Or we'll feel really bad and we'll feel a healthy guilt after we've messed up. That's to grieve the Holy Spirit. And if we're grieved by the Holy Spirit, let's respond to the Holy Spirit by confessing our sins and turn away from those sins. One commentator from the pulpit commentary said this. I'm going to answer the question, how and when do we grieve the Holy Spirit? This is deep, but this is what he says. When his work is obstructed. In other words, when the Holy Spirit says to do something and we don't, that's to grieve the Holy Spirit. When sin is trifled with or played with, when deity is treated carelessly, when we use the Lord's name in vain or when we don't use it with respect, that is to grieve the Holy Spirit. When the spirit of the world is cherished, in other words, when we enjoy the world more than enjoying God, when we enjoy the things of this world, the pleasures and the lust of this world and not God, the Holy Spirit is grieved by that. To grieve the Spirit is to help to obliterate the seal and thus weaken the evidence of our redemption. That's heavy. We've been marked by the Holy Spirit. We have the character of Christ that should be growing out of us. And to to not live like the Spirit of God wants us to, to not live like Jesus wants us to do, to, it, it, it messes up the image and the reputation of God and really the seal over our life, the Holy Spirit, it grieves him, it hurts him. Now this, this goes into a whole big theological discussion and I don't have time for it today. It's for another day about can we walk away from God? And this scripture and other scriptures need to be read in full context like Hebrews 3, 12 through 14, that our hearts as believers can be hardened and dis- and um, deceived by sin, and we can turn away from God. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit so much and continue in sin so much that our hearts are hardened and we turn away from God. Wow. That is a heavy message for Mother's Day, isn't it? (laughs) But Paul loves this church, and he's calling them to a, a standard of Christ. And to be honest with you, I appreciate the, Paul speaking the truth in love to us. And lastly, he says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. An exchange. Your old nature, get rid of it. Instead, be the way God has treated you with kindness, tenderheartedness, and love. The word bitter here in the Greek has to do with this resentful spirit that refuses reconciliation. That's scary. He's saying, don't be like that. Be open to reconciliation. Slander is abusive language that defames or hurts the reputation of another believer in Christ, another person, to to make them look bad on purpose. We should never do that in the family of God, ever. We should be very careful. And instead, to show kindness, tenderheartedness, and love and forgiveness. So, here's our big takeaway today. Get rid of your grave clothes and live in your grace clothes, is what Paul's saying. Get rid of your grave clothes, your past, your old nature, 
and put on your new grace clothes. Make sure you're living in them. The question is, is how do we do it? Let me wrap up our message today. Thank you for hanging out a little longer. That was a lot of ground to cover, wasn't it? A lot of verses. So how do we do it? How do we do this? First, don't look back. Paul says, you are no longer like that. Don't live like the Gentiles, the unsaved Gentiles are living. Do not look back. Church, there is nothing in our old life that is worth our attention and focus. Amen? There is nothing. I learned through life that whatever we focus on, we become. Whatever we focus on, we become. And I have a word for today. I wrote this down, so I'm going to read it word for word. But I feel like this is for someone. Don't know who. It's really for all of us. It's a lesson for all of us. But this is, if this is for someone particularly, be encouraged by this word. Repentance, it, it means to turn away from sin and turn towards God. So to not look back, this is why I put this here. Repentance can create a crisis in your life depending on how entangled you are in a sin or how dependent you are of that thing or person you are repenting of or from. Repentance is one of the hardest things you will do because turning away from something that is evil or sinful can leave a hole in your life. It's hard to turn away and it creates a hole because you love it or have grown comfortable with it in your life but now you're giving it up for God. Not to mention the spiritual warfare you will face and the community of people who will come to discourage you. You know why? Because they too live in it and they want you to stay in it. Or you'll just be influenced because they're still doing it and they look happy. I've heard this before. Hey, their life is great. They're doing great. Why would I leave it? I got encouraging news for you today. If you are afraid to repent and turn away from something, to, or you, maybe you're looking back and you're, you're, you're looking at that and going, man, I gave that up for, for Christ. And man, things haven't been that great following Christ. It's been worse, actually. Listen, let me tell you something. When we turn around, Jesus is there to fill that hole. And so is our church. Jesus is there to fill that hole. When you repent from this world, you're not missing out on anything. When you repent and you turn to God, you're gaining everything. Oh, man, that's, that's my story. That's my story. I found a love I could never find anywhere else in God. Well, that makes sense. How do we put off the grave clothes and put on the grace, grace clothes? We don't look back at our old life. That was verses 17 through 19. I put it right there. Well, guess what was right after that? Look toward Jesus and learn more from him. That was the next verses. Keep your eyes, fix your eyes on Jesus. <laughs> fix your eyes on Jesus. Why would we do that? Because that's who you are now in God's eyes is you're like one of his children. And Jesus is the firstborn of many sons and daughters, scripture says. He's our big brother. And he is... He is who exactly who we should become. So the one of the ways you walk away from your old life is you walk towards your new life in Jesus Christ. As you do that, guess what happens? Number three, follow the Holy Spirit as he convicts and guides you through the word. By the way, Paul mentions the Trinity again in our scripture today. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He mentions all three again. He loves doing that. As we follow Jesus, the Holy Spirit is there today to represent Jesus. This is, this is doctrine. This is teaching in scripture. This is Romans. This is John 12 through 14. This is Acts, the whole book. As we follow Jesus today, because Jesus is with the Father, but his Holy Spirit was sent down to us, he is here to guide us and convict us into all things that are like Christ. Follow his lead. Let's not grieve him, let's follow his lead and his example. And the way we do that is through his word. The Holy Spirit teaches and guides through his word. You will be reading scripture and the Holy Spirit shows you something you need to hear. And it's always so good. 
And lastly, live the new life of Christ because you are new through Christ. Consider yourself new and live that way. Don't go to the trash can and get all that stuff that you threw away. Say, get rid of bitterness. Trash stinks. It's gross. And so is that old way of life. We got rid of it. Don't go rummaging through the dumpster, putting it back on. That's not you. Now you're acting. Who you truly are in God's eyes is like Jesus. Not perfect, but on your way, growing and growing more to be like Jesus. And here's really something important. As you're focusing on Christ, you'll focus less on sin. You know what a lot of us do? We do sin management. Because some of us are good cleaners. So we like to clean up all the trash around, you know. We'll do sin management. And that's religion. That's not grace. You have already been set free from your past. You have already been forgiven. You already have a new identity. So don't start counting how many sins you did and how many good things you did today. That's what religion does. Instead, enjoy your new creation. Enjoy who you are in Christ. You're loved. You're forgiven. You have a task. God has given you his will to do, to love others, to love him, to serve, to share the gospel. If we get preoccupied with the Lord's will, we'll care less about our old life. That's what Paul is saying, to get rid of it. As you're putting on your new creation, your new self. Amen? One of the best ways that you can grow and be who you truly are is to focus on being who you truly are. And that's what Paul's trying to say. Wow. Let's pray. And I got word that in India right now, there is devastation taking place because of COVID, the lack of vaccines, the lack of hospitals, Christians, missionaries, churches are suffering. We want to lift them up in prayer right now as well. God, we think of India and many other countries too who do not have what we have, who are suffering today. I pray, Lord, that your grace and mercy would be upon them. Lord, supernaturally empower pastors with the ability to heal and to do miracles where they are. Missionaries, Lord, and church members, Lord, empower them through your spirit, Lord, to do miracles where they are. Lord, provide for them, Lord, in India and other countries who are suffering, Lord, Provide for them, Lord God. Eliminate this virus in Jesus' name. Lord, get rid of it, Lord God. Lord, I pray that through this unfortunate event, God, that the church's love would rise up, Lord. I pray they would seize this opportunity and protect them. May may people see that the church is being protected by your power in the midst of handling those who are sick. Do miracles, Lord Jesus, in Jesus' name. Lord, we lift up this church to you. We thank you that we're not who we used to be and you've called us to be who we're supposed to be. And Jesus is our example. Help us to put on the new nature. Lord, we thank you for your son's example. We thank you for the Holy Spirit and the word that helps us. And Lord, I pray again that you be with everyone who's celebrating moms today. What a blessing it is. Be with all of those, Lord, who are also missing mom. Lord, comfort them during this day and this time. God, we lean into you for everything we need. You'll never let us down. We love you. We praise you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.